Welcome to Wednesday night. Stand and join us for worship.
Christ and take a moment fellowship with the Holy Spirit it's between you and him we're just elevating his power and his presence just take a moment and fellowship with him slipped your voice the Bible says that the spirit indwells us the spirit lives in us he guides us he teaches us he leads us he speaks to us in that still small voice so just take a moment just fellowship with him just fellowship with him Jesus says and when he the spirit of truth has come that is the truth giving spirit has come he will guide you into all truth and he will tell you of things to come because he will receive of me and give to you he will lead us into all truth it is estimated that the average person makes 35,000 decisions in a day 35,000 decisions every day can you imagine why Jesus says that the Spirit will guide you, He will lead you, He will help you. Every day we are torn between junctions of life and we have to make decisions. We have to go either left or right. We have to go either this way or that way. Sometimes some of the decisions don't make sense in the natural sense. What the Holy Spirit is asking you to do, it doesn't make sense to your natural mind. The Bible says that they that are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. When the Bible says he's the spirit of truth, what it means is that he's not talking about superficial knowledge. He's talking about reality. The Greek word means reality. That that Holy Spirit will show you the truth that you need to apply to your reality. He's the spirit of truth, Holy Spirit. We welcome you in this assembly. We have gathered here. You said where we... Where two or three are gathered in your name, you are there in the midst of them. By your spirit, you are here. Guide us from within us, away from the noise. Lead us, guide us, teach us. Holy Spirit, we desire you. We desire fellowship with you like never before. We love you. We love your presence. We love your direction. We love the leadings. Help us. Thank you, Lord. We give you praise. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Amen. Praise God. Just give a shout of praise to the Lord. Just give a shout of praise to the Lord. Amen. Thank you, Lord. You can take your seats and bring the house light so we can make room for some teaching tonight anytime we come before the presence of the lord the holy spirit that is living on the inside of us bible says that he leads us he guides us he's indwelling us for a reason and especially when we come together like this he's not only in us for ourselves he's on us for others so we can enjoy him together so he is both in us and upon us and when he is upon us it is the anointing that comes to make the difficult things look easy and how many decisions that could have forestalled some problems if we had depended on the Holy Spirit there are some decisions I had made in life that I wish I had allowed the Holy Spirit to lead me some of the mistakes that we have made is because we ignore the truth of God's word. Jesus says that when he, the spirit of truth, in John 13, verse, it's John 16, verse 13, has been a, was a scripture that I was meditating on it for a while, uh, the beginning of the year, and this uh, afternoon it came back to me, and then uh, sh they were singing about the Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit. So like, and I, remind, I was reminded of the fact that every day, the average person makes about 35,000 decisions. 
from deciding to whether to get up from the bed at 7.14 or 7.16. From whether you're going to take a shower or not, whether you're going to brush your teeth or not, from whether you're going to comb your hair or not, from whether you're going to use your deodorant or not, whether you're going to wear black pants or blue jeans or whatever it is, 35,000 decisions per day. Bible says in Romans 8 14 that and they that are led by the Spirit of God they are the sons of God amen that is why we want to be led uh, let's just want to welcome you to Wednesday Bible um, Bible study and I trust that you've been blessed Pastor Mavis has been doing a tremendous job on the non-negotiables those are the ones that you cannot negotiate on amen there are some some ones you can debate on but these ones, if you miss them, you are in trouble. These are the, the doctrines. These are the things that will build you up. These are the things that will give you the physical ability, the physicality to be able to play the game. When you go in the gym as a, as a footballer or a soccer player, you are building stamina. So when you get on the field, you'll be able to run all throughout and be able to endure the game. So when we come to teach doctrines and, and, and biblical precepts like this, we are building strength so that when the D-Day comes, because it's going to come, the day of adversity is coming. And that is when you will know whether you are a Christian, whether you will deny Jesus or not knowing the truth. And so it is important that we fasten our seed belt and get these truth in us so we can live the life that is real. It's not this fake life that uh, the world is trying to misdirect us to lead, but to lead a real life, the truth, which is Jesus Christ. Because the truth is not a philosophy, it's a person. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. He is the way, the truth, and the life. Amen. Let's bless the Lord with our tithes and our offerings. If you didn't get the privilege to give on Sunday, uh, here is the opportunity for you. And let's bless the Lord. Thank you for your continued generosity. Thank you for your hearts of sacrifice. Uh, you are sowing into eternity. And I don't know how many times or how we need to remind ourselves that as a Christian, you have to live your life in view of eternity. If you miss that, that is one of the hallmarks of Christianity. If you miss it, then we are really wasting our time. First Corinthians, I think chapter 15, verse 19, it says that if only in this life that we have hope, then we are of all men most miserable. So if you're a Christian and you're not living your life in, in, in view of eternity, then you are missing a big chunk of what Christianity is all about. So whenever you drop that offering, whenever you write that tithe, you know that you are writing it because you believe in eternity. We are not taking any of this with us. Amen. The only, only one we get to keep is what we send ahead of us. So, Father, help us, guide us by your truth, and teach us and lead us that we will walk by faith and not by sight. For as we see the days approaching, that we will continue to gather even much more, that we will not be deceived. As Paul was praying for the Thessalonica church, he says, I, I want to be sure, so I sent Timothy so that he will, he will affirm your faith to me. Otherwise, the tempter would have come to tempt you. In 1 Thessalonians 3, he says, I was so worried about you. If Paul was worried, I was thinking about it today and praying about it. I said, Lord, help us to help your church so that we will not fail in the day of adversity. In the name of Jesus, help us. We thank you and we trust you. In Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. At the beginning of every month, it's our aim to intentionally set the tone by growing in our faith through scripture, prayer, and fasting. We do this by kicking off a church-wide Bible reading plan and dedicating the first seven days to prayer week. This month, we'll be reading through the book of Psalms together. This is a 43-day study, reading on average of three Psalms per day. You can join the study by going on our app, scanning the QR code on the back of the chair in front of you, or grabbing a calendar at the info booth. This Friday also kicks off our July Prayer Week, and what better way to kick it off than with Fire in the Night from 7 to 9 p.m. 
We will then gather again on Tuesday the 5th from 5.30 to 6.30 p.m. on Wednesday for our midweek service and then finishing strong on Thursday with another gathering from 5.30 to 6.30 p.m. Let's keep growing and seeking God together. We encourage you to come to one of these gatherings because God is moving and we don't want you to miss it. As June is quickly coming to an end, this is the last week we have to reach our $25,000 match and hit our first benchmark in our Super Church remodel. We're believing that we will reach this goal and officially be over the halfway mark to our $200,000 goal. Thank you so very much for your kindness and generosity as we endeavor to reach this next generation. We will be revealing our goal numbers on July the 10th. Just a reminder that next Sunday, July 3rd, we'll only have one service at 9 a.m. And also note that we will only have childcare classes for kids up to six years old. Help us spread the word and come and join us next Sunday morning at 9 a.m. Hey, Wednesday night crew. Yes, welcome. Awesome, we're so glad you're here. Proud of you for carving time out of this beautiful 95 degree day. Yeah. Come on. Could use about 10 degrees more, right, Pastor Sam? But we'll take 95. Yeah. Oh man, I love the heat. So we're so blessed that you would take time to come and study God's word. I really feel like we're diving in this summer. You know, we're diving in in all ways, you know, in our giving, in our praying, uh, in our contending. So let's, let's remember to just keep that posture. Amen. Uh, in, in Minnesota, a lot of times it's easy to just think, well, forget it. I've been cooped up for eight months. I'm out of here. Right. But remember, we have to stay connected with God and stay. And, you know, you can stay connected online, too, but stay connected. Stay a part of what God's doing. Be in that Bible reading program. That's been tremendous. Amen. Yeah. Sorry, I'm preaching to the choir. It's a Wednesday night crew. But thank you for being here. Thank you for, I mean, just showing your love for God and his word. Amen. Such a blessing. God, we're so grateful to be a part of a moving church. Pastor mentioned it on Sunday that there's churches in town that are even downscaling and reorganizing. And we're so thankful that we're moving forward, God. We're not closing the doors. We're not cutting back. Come on. We're building. We're moving forward. We're expanding for the next generation. God, we thank you for your spirit. We thank you for the presence that's here through worship and giving, exhortation. God, we just bless you and thank you. God, I ask you tonight that you would help me to uh, enunciate your word, to make it clear. God, you're the best teacher. God, would you teach us tonight? I thank you for the anointing that breaks the yoke, God. Help us to move forward in freedom in your spirit, in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Well, praise God. Right. I'm excited to be doing this series. It's really just one of my passions is, is studying doctrine. Um, I know that really sounds boring to some people, but it fires me up. I had a friend from a, in a different state uh, that has been watching, you know, and she said, thanks for not making it boring. And I thought, praise God, right? right. So we ought to be excited about the things of God and knowing him more. You know, just to, I love the, the heart of our pastors to equip us. Really, we feel that weight in these days because you see so many weird things out there in the church. I'm not talking about the world. That's a whole nother banana. But uh, Jesus really spoke about how the end times would be rife with deception. And I think that's a really big indicator that we're there, you know, uh, where we're, our hearts are to have you equipped. That was Paul's heart in writing. A lot of the letters were to confront error that was coming out in the church. So this is a very biblical thing to do. What's our antidote to error and deception? That's growing in the knowledge of God. Amen. Sharing this to uh, quote by Tozer again, because I think it's so important. He says, what comes into our minds when we think about God is the most important thing about us. Now, even if you don't agree with that fully or understand it, realize that that's the truth. Because if we're made in the image of God, what we think about God even, even goes down to how we view ourselves in our lives. So it's really a key thing. So we're talking about these non-negotiables. 
And I just want to make this clear. This, uh, what you're getting in Wednesday nights is like the appetizer. Okay? <laughs> the appetizer. We're just beginning to study these things. We're not, I'm not endeavoring to co cover them to the full. And actually, we're talking about God. So this is, to me, this is trying to like empty the ocean a thimble at a time. That's what, you know what a thimble, maybe y'all don't know that your mama wore that on her finger when she was sewing. Do you know what that is? It's like about this big. Yeah. And it's like digging into the ocean of God and, and pouring out. And that's how much I feel like we've covered and because he's so amazing. Yeah. So what are these non-negotiables? Just five things that the Bible is the inspired word of God and it's therefore inerrant. That means it's without error and it's authoritative. That means it, it should carry weight in our lives, the weight. We're talking about the attributes of God, which we'll finish tonight, the person of Christ. I'm hoping to start that tonight, the nature of man and the requirement of the atonement. Those are the five areas that I want to cover in this series. Uh, and so again, number one, that the Bible is the inspired word of God and is therefore inerrant and authoritative. And then the attributes of God, we started and so, uh, you know, really, like I said, trying to describe how God is, is like taking the smallest little cup and dipping in the ocean and saying he's like this, yeah. because he's so much better yeah. than we can say. I, I thought of a scripture today, Job 36, 26, and I love this scripture. I love them all, but you know, it says, behold, God is great and we do not know him. Come on. Yeah. I know that's really encouraging right? But that's what I want. See, what we've done in our society is we've tried to make man the measure of all things. So then God has been reduced to our man ideas about God. And I want to blow up that thing because God is so much greater. We could sit here for a thousand years and talk about his faithfulness and we wouldn't have a speck of it talked about. Come on. All right, I'll get you going here. Let's just go, right? So what's an attribute? If we use a word like that, we mean that's, that's an inherent characteristic of a person or a being. They don't add, these words don't add anything to God, but they reveal something about his nature and how he is. Um, every attribute that we find about God in the scripture is true of all of God's being. Uh, I think... Um, that's one of the most important things that you can know, that he's not sometimes this way. Like, you know, sometimes people are mad and sometimes they're nice. Sometimes they're generous and sometimes they're stingy. Sometimes they're faithful and sometimes they betray you. People are flip-floppers. Right. Right. God never does that. He's always 100% love, 100% just, 100% holy. All of those attributes are interlaced, and that's important because when we get off of that, that's when we begin to slip into error in our thinking about God and his dealings with man. There's two categories, and there's several names that we could call these, but I just chose these two, uh, incommunicable and communicable. Incommunicable is these are the attributes that only God has, okay? Like only God is omnipresent, not the devil, ha. Huh? Right. right? Only God is omnipresent. Now, the, the communicable ones, we sometimes can share those with God, like God is love, and we can be love or show love sometimes, yeah. okay? God is holy, and what did he say to us? Blows your mind, but be holy like God is holy, right? So these are ones that we can share with him. Now, can I just give you a little commercial? No, I'll do it later. So I want to start this, and I'll explain it because it's easier when you look at the slide. I gave us a review of just what we covered last week because we don't have time to re-go over them again. But these are the incommunicable attributes. God is spirit. That's his essence. That's what he's made of, kind of, his substance. God is changeless. Another word for that is immutability. Um, I just love that about God. Again, he's not a flip-flopper. If he said it, it's so. And he'll never change. He's self-existent. That, that word is a saity. That's a theological term. So if you, I just like to throw those in there because if you run across those when you're reading, then you'll know what it means, you know? So there you go. But that means that he is existent in himself. He doesn't need anything else to exist. He's God because he's God because he's God. 
It's how he is, who he is in himself. He's all-powerful, omnipotent. He's all-knowing, omniscient. And that just doesn't mean he knows everything now. He knows everything that will ever be. He knows everything of all time, all at the same time. Oh, man, don't make me preach it again. I could go. God is everywhere at the same time. Past, present, future. All right? He's eternal. There's no beginning, no end. He's imminent. That means he's involved in creation. He just didn't start this thing like a basketball and spun it and said, let's go. He started creation and he's involved in it. I love serving a God that rolled up his sleeves and says, I want to be with you. I want to be in life with you. I want to be involved with you. But he's also transcendent. That means he's greater. He's above all of creation. There's nothing like him. Okay, then last week, uh, really the attributes are how God is. If we want to know how God is, God is like this always. Okay, Uh, the next we started the communicable. Those are the ones we can share with him. And again, all of this might sound familiar to you. Uh, You might have heard this before. You might already know this. Good, right? Let's be reminded of the truths of the Bible. Amen? Okay, God is holy. That means he's ho- there's no one like him. He's holy other than all of creation. He's righteous. That means all the manifestation of his characters are right. Just settle it right now. I, it'd be great if we, we can share this a little bit with him, but God is always right. Yeah, that's right. Oh, I want to be. Anybody else always want to be right? When I was younger, oh my gosh, I'm so glad I grew up. And if you always thought you were right and would argue for your side, come on, nobody like me. God is always really, really right, righteous. He's just. That means God is entirely correct and just in all of his dealings. He always does the right thing. Okay? God is love. I mean, that one's probably been taught more than any. And it's true of him even though he's just, or sometimes he judges things, he judges and we'll see great judgment come upon the earth in the future. That doesn't mean that he doesn't love. He judges because he loves. Yeah. Any of you have children that you disciplined? Right. Nobody enjoys that, right. right? But I love them too much not to. Right. See, so it helps us to understand children. You learn a lot about God having children. Come on, we, I don't have time. God is truth. Let's go to a new one here. God is truth. Pastor Sam gave a wonderful uh, introduction to this one. Now, let me give you the commercial. Here it is. So every one of these attributes, uh, it has this little box in the side because we don't have time. Again, this could be taught on for weeks, okay? Just this one attribute. But I put these scriptures here so you could get out your phones, iPhone, Samsung, whatever you have, Google, whatever, uh, Snap that, and you can make a study of it yourself. And I've had people contact me wanting the whole slideshow. If you want to, just give me your email, and I'll mail you the whole slideshow, because we went through all the ones I just described were set up like this, so they had this the scripture. So if you missed anything, I'll always send you stuff. I'll send you my notes, slideshows. This is the commercial that I mentioned before, because my heart is for you to learn and grow. Okay, not just blast you with information, which happens sometimes. So, God is truth. It helps us to quote a couple things. You know, Jesus, when he prayed in John 17, he prayed to God, his father, the only true God. Okay? Called his father the only true God. And Paul, I'm not, we're not looking at these scriptures, but in 1 Thessalonians, uh, Paul talked about converting from idols to serve the living and true God. Okay, so when we talk about the true God, and see, this is why it's so important to define things, even the simplest words like this, because we live in a society that is redefining everything. You can say amen to that, all right? And so we need to know what the Bible means by that and what true or truth really is. So when we talk about the true God, we talk about the authentic God versus something, an idol or a philosophy or something else. Does that make sense? So we're talking about the true God. Uh, God is the truth, 
or let me give you this. God, God is all that he is as God should be, and that his word and revelation are completely reliable. Okay? Completely reliable. God is truth in his person, and God is truth in his revelation. It means that he's completely true. He's reliable, okay? God cannot lie, okay? I mean, just let these things sink into you. God cannot lie. He's the truth. His word to mankind is absolutely reliable. Everything he's promised, he will do. Okay? Everything. Everything. God always speaks the truth when he speaks. Okay? Do you have people that you wonder if it's the truth when they're speaking to you? Come on, let's just be real. Okay? God always speaks the truth. Every word, Proverbs 30 says, every word of God proves true. Okay? God's words are not simply true, but they're truth in themselves. Okay? And again, it sounds like I'm splitting hairs. They are the final standard and definition of truth. By the truthfulness of God, uh, in being a communicable, that means the, something we share with him, we can imitate it by having true knowledge of God, like we're, we're doing. We're digging in. As Christians, we want the true knowledge of God. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. Now, here's a good one. Faithfulness. God is faithful. Aren't you glad? Amen. Oh, come on now. Amen. He's dependable. Come on. In his nature and in his actions, he's dependable. Okay. I think there's a verse on there, Isaiah 25, 1. And uh, I left this in there so that you can see the original language literal. I will exalt you and praise your name for in perfect faithfulness. And that's so I, I probably will mispronounce it, sorry. Imuna omen. That literally means the faithfulness of reliability. You've done marvelous things, things planned long ago. The faithfulness of reliability. I love that. See, the Lord shows us his faithfulness by keeping his promises. So powerful. He's the faithful God. Look at this. Uh, Deuteronomy 7.9. Knowing, therefore, that the Lord your God is God. Look at this. Well, he's what? He's the what? Faithful God. See, some of us need to know this deep. Because we've had people let us down. We've had situations let us down. We've had disappointments. But what God is... Oh, come on. I know you're more awake than that. God is faithful. He's faithful. He keeps his covenant of love to a thousand generations of those who love him and keep his commandments. He's faithful. Amen. Joshua, at the end of his life, said, God hasn't dropped one of his promises concerning me. We'll be able to say that of God, too. Yeah. Amen. All right. God is wisdom. God is wisdom. God's wisdom is revealed, I love this one, in doing the best thing in the best way, at the best time, for the best purpose. Oh man, I just want to read it again because I like it so much. God's wisdom in revealed in his doing the best thing in the best way at the best time for the best purpose. See, that's why we can trust him. And then he's faithful to top it off at the same time. He's faithful to you doing the best thing at the best time for the best purpose. I love it. He's called the only wise God. We see God's wisdom uh, in his creation. That's why, you know, you can talk to Mr. Tom Leach over here. He'll, he'll talk to you about creationism. But how the more they dig into the way things are created and, you know, the more they can, the stronger microscopes they get and break down things more, even more, they, they think this isn't an accident that the eye was made this way, that the body was made this way, that nature was made this way. Come on. We see his wisdom in creation. We see his wisdom in the great plan of redemption. 
The Bible says, and the way we share this is the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. So we, by fearing God, we start off in wisdom. Amen? All right. Uh, number eight, God is merciful. Merciful. So good. Aren't you glad you haven't gotten what you deserve? Sometimes people demand their rights. We ought not to. Because what if we were really given what we deserve? Minus Jesus now. Y'all can be proud of Jesus, right? But come on, minus Jesus. What if we all got what we deserved? Jesus got what we deserved. So we can get what we don't deserve. That's grace, but we'll talk about that in a minute. Mercy. Mercy is God's love in action for those who don't deserve it. That's me, right? But, do, but we so desperately need his love. The goodness of God toward all of his creatures, especially sinful men, is a special feature of God's mercy. God's mercy means God's goodness towards those in misery and distress. And oftentimes you'll see mercy, grace, and patience together. So God's mercy is not getting what we do deserve. His grace is getting what we don't deserve. Okay, don't, I'm not losing you. And his patience means that he just withholds punishment because he could do it every day. Come on, right? None of us are perfect. Those three characteristics, a lot of times we see them together. So that brings us up to number nine. God is gracious. Amen. He's so gracious. And again, that talks about his unmerited favor. That's giving us stuff that we don't deserve. Salvation is one of those things. This word, when you talk about this word, it's talking about deliverance from our enemies, affliction or adversity. That grace is an enablement. It's daily guidance, forgiveness, preservation. And then, you know, we can have grace for people too, right? We can have patience for people or give people, be nice to people when they're not nice to us. That's being gracious. All right, look at, look at this one. I love it. Psalm 103, verse eight. The Lord is compassionate. And what? Gracious. Slow to anger and abounding in love. Isn't that awesome? That's how God is. Whole bunch of attributes there. All right, number 10, last one of the attributes at least. The Hebrew word tob expresses the absolute goodness of God. Now, this is what I've said all along. If people really knew how God was, they would run to him. And if people really knew how good God could be, have any of you ever experienced the goodness of God? Yeah. Right there. The Greek word, agathos, means that God is essentially, absolutely, and consummately good. See, there's no bad in God. Oh, man, I could just... Pounce on this one a little bit if I had time. There's no bad in God. He's not, see again, he's not sometimes good and sometimes bad. Sometimes happy and sometimes mad. Sometimes angry and sometimes benevolent. He's good. He's good. In his correction or his chastisement of us, he's good. Come on. In his direction to us, in his training us, he's good. He's good all the time, greater than any goodness a person could ever be. Come on, greater. His, his goodness, and, and the best part about his goodness is he demonstrates it to us. You know, there's people that are good, but they keep all the good to themselves. Oh my gosh, come on. God's good to us all. He shows his goodness. You know, uh, over and over in the scriptures, you say, oh, oh, give thanks to the Lord for he is good. So many times I thought, man, I think I've read this before when I first started reading Psalms, and I had. David encourages us to taste and see that the Lord is good. And what's the best thing about that verse? It, God's goodness can be experienced. Taste it. See it experience it, the goodness of God. 
Good is what God approves of. And see, this is where the rub starts to be because we want to make our own definition of what is good. Smile at your neighbor and said she's talking to you. Come on, right? But the definition for good starts with God. And good is the thing that God, if God says it's good, it's what? If God says it's not good, it's not good. Amen. All right, there's no higher standard of goodness than God's own character and his approval of whatever is consistent with that character. The scriptures also tell us that he's the source of all the good in the world. You know, sometimes people will say, well, well, that happened to you because you're a good person. No, it happened to me because God is good and he's merciful. Amen? So James 1.17, let's look at a couple verses here. James 1.17, every good endowment, every good and perfect gift is from where? Above, coming down from the Father of lights with whom there is no variation or shadow due to change. Again, a couple attributes that we see there that is good, but also that he doesn't change. So see, I don't know about you, but I live part of my Christian life thinking, well, God's good, but I was waiting for the hammer to fall. Do you ever just think this is just too good? I'm just, you just feel like that. But see, you don't have to be concerned about that with God because he's not a flip-flopper, like I said. He's not going to change tomorrow and not be good. Come on. He's always good. I love it. Amen? Okay, one more scripture on that, then we'll wrap this up. Psalm 145, 9. The Lord is, come on, to all. Wow. The Lord is good to all. See, that's mercy. It's good to all. And his tender mercies are all over all his works. I love it. All right, let's just wrap up the attributes. You've been so good. So in terms of practical application, this means that we should never think, for example, that God is loving at one day, right? We all got that. I pounded on that enough. And then he's angry one day. Okay, he's always the same. He's the same God always. And see, I love that. I want to be able to depend on somebody. Right? And in the coming days, we're going to need a God we can depend on. Everything he says or does is always consistent with these attributes and more. There's more to learn about him. But God has always been infinitely just and infinitely loving as well. See, I've heard this so many times that the God of the Old Testament was the God of judgment and the God of the New Testament is the God of love. It's all intertwined. God is always the same. All right, are you ready for this? All right, let's just say, God, thank you, right, for being all that you are. Okay, I want to show you another fun thing just to wake you up. I should have probably started with this. I have a graphic for you. What do you think about that? Okay. Now, here's a really sad thing. This guy, Michael Gunger, is an ex-worship leader. Do any of y'all recognize him from, I can't remember the group he was in. Anyway, led worship. And I don't know, I, I cut it off, sorry. You know, blah, 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 hundreds of thousands or likes and... There's, there's a guy that used to lead worship, lead, lead people into the presence of God, and now this is his. Yeah, this is an example of the deception and not having a grounding in these things to be able to move away from it. And, you know, the whole thing is, I don't care that Michael, Gun- I do care. But I'm not as concerned about Mr. Gunger having that belief, but I'm very concerned about him spreading that to the thousands of people he influenced in worship And then he's going to turn around and say, Buddha is the same as Jesus. Let's go to Matthew 24. We're going to, we're going to begin studying the person of Christ tonight. Of course, we won't cover it fully in the few minutes that we have left, but I just want to give myself an introduction. Then we'll bounce into it the next time we're together. Matthew 24. Again, I showed you these verses before, but I want to show you again. As they sat on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately saying, tell us when will these things be and what will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? And Jesus answered and said, take heed 
that no one deceives you. First thing, for many will come how? Come on, y'all. In my name. Okay? This isn't outside of the church. Come in my name saying what? I am the Christ. So if you don't know the attributes and the person of Christ and who he is, we could think that was true. He said they're going to be able to deceive you. And a lot of the, the five deceptions that we talked about in Matthew 24 are mainly tied to the person of Christ. Okay? I used to think that people were coming and faking out being Jesus. No, I'm th this is what I think now as I've meditated on this and studied it. These are people that are going to agree that Jesus is the Christ, but he's this way too, or he thinks this way. And so they, there's going to be a lot of mixture in it. Verse 5, for many will come in my name, in my name, saying, I'm the Christ and will deceive many. Verse 11, Many false prophets rise up and deceive many, verse 23 through 26. Then if anyone says to you, look, here is the, see, the deception is tied to Jesus and who he is there. Don't believe it. For false Christ, false prophets will rise and great, uh, show great signs and wonders to deceive, if possible, even the elect. See, I've told you beforehand. Again, this reminds me so much of what pastor has been teaching you, Jesus said, I told you, but we have to take heed to what he says. Amen. The study of the person and the work of Christ is at the very center of Christian theology. For since Christians, by definition, are followers of Christ, their understanding of Christ must be central and determinative of the very character of the Christian faith. If we call ourselves Christian, that means we're, we're following Christ, right? Yeah. So we should know him. And not just in name. Come on. All right? We should know him. Jesus is the eternal God as the second person of the Trinity. In the incarnation, he took on human nature. Being born of a virgin, he died for humankind's sins and three day, days later physically rose from the dead. You see, what sets Christianity apart from all of the other world religions is simply the person of Jesus Christ. Okay, let's look at a scripture. I think we have just the uh, amount of time. And this, again, this is introduction, then we'll, I'll give you the, the full meat of this next time. 1 John 4, let's look at this one scripture. 1 John 4, 9 through 10. I, I love how John writes. This is how God showed his love. Aren't you glad God didn't just keep his love to himself? This is how God showed his love among us. So you see, you can see the layers of these attributes just in this one verse. He sent his one and only son into the world that we might live through him. This is love. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. Okay? I just want to show you three basic truths about Jesus from this, just these two scriptures. And these, this is just a start off for us, okay? Number one, Jesus lived in history. He's not a made-up idea. He's not a made-up philosophy. He's not a, a, a made-up man. He's not a man that lived and died and is still dead. Come on. He lived in history. See, John emphasizes it in that verse, and, and, and you can see it when he said that he, his, his love was among us, and he came where? Into the world. So that shows that he, he was with us and in the world. He lived in history. You see, Christianity is oriented toward the actual saving work of a person. It's not an ideology. It's about a person. Jesus Christ. You see, if Jesus Christ didn't live in history, die on the cross, raise from the dead, then we're all still in our sins. Amen. Right. It's about a real person that lived in history. Secondly, this verse reveals to us that God himself became flesh. John writes that God sent his one and only son Jesus is the son of God in an entirely unique way. You know, it, it calls us sons of God, but he is the only begotten son of God. That means he shares the nature of God. 
Okay, and we'll, we'll dig into this a little bit more. But through Jesus, God became man in the flesh. John 1, 14, and the word became, and what? Dwelt among us in history. It's so powerful. And lastly, in this verse, we learn that Jesus conquered death. Jesus' story doesn't end in defeat with death having the final word. Aren't you glad? It ends in victory because his story is our story too, with Jesus physically rising from the dead. No other founder of any religion ever invented or talked about on the earth has even considered making such a claim. Only Jesus. Jesus' resurrection is why John could say that we might live through him because he lives. Amen? Amen. Let me give you this last verse. Next, next week, we'll break down about seven things about Jesus and get us firm in our understanding of who the person of Christ is. Well, let's look at, we have a, we have a minute. Let's look at those. G, these are our Jesus non-negotiables that we're going to look at next week. And again, this, we're just going to touch on these. I'll probably give you a thousand scriptures to look up for yourselves. His virgin birth that Jesus is 100% God and he's 100% man. The historical reality of the life of Christ, we've touched on that tonight because it's so important. He's not a made-up person or a made-up idea. We'll talk about his death, burial, resurrection. You're you're not believing that I'm going to get this done in, in 30 minutes, but I will. His ascension and his second coming. See, only Jesus, only Jesus did all these things. Come on, right? Only Jesus. All right, let's finish with this scripture, Philippians 3. 10, I want to read it out of the Amplified because I just love how it's worded. Paul said this, and I want us to remember that this is at the end of Paul's life. He's sitting in a prison cell, writing with a chain tied to his arm, clanking as he's writing the scripture. And he says, my determined purpose is that I may know him. And see, that's why I'm just saying, I'm not talking to you, but I want want us to stop in Christianity thinking that we know something. Paul, probably the, the strongest Christian to ever live, at the end of his life, he says, I just want to know him. Then we ought to be running after that knowledge, amen? My determined purpose is that I may know him, that I may progressively become more deeply and intimately acquainted with him perceiving and recognizing and understanding the wonders of his person more strongly and clearly. And that's going to be our endeavor next week to dig into Jesus and know him more. And he continues, I may in the same way come to know the power outflowing from his resurrection, which it exerts over believers, and that I may so share with his sufferings as to be continually transformed in spirit into his likeness, even to his death. Jesus is amazing, and we ought to know him. Amen? All right, let's bow our heads tonight. Jesus, we thank you. We thank you for all that you taught us about the attributes of God. God, we just want to know you more. God, even if it is just a thimble, God, we want to drink it all dry. We want to know you as much as we can. God, you're so good, and we don't say that flippantly. And Jesus, we just want to know you more. God, I just pray that even as we're going into this next week and going through this holiday weekend, there's there's so much talk about so many different things, but Jesus, let's just let it be about you. Thank you, Lord. God, I pray that everyone under the sound of my voice has a personal relationship with you. God, that they're seeking you with all of their hearts. And God, that you're drawing them closer and closer to you. God, release hunger into our hearts even now, God, to know him more. Thank you, Father. In the mighty name of Jesus, amen. 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 Love you guys. Love you guys. Don't forget about fire in the night on Friday. That's a good thing to do during that soaking time. Bring these scriptures about the attributes of God and just get get to know God in prayer. Amen. And then again, don't forget Sunday, one service. Just one 9 a.m. service. We love y'all. Have an amazing, amazing rest of your week. Thank you. Thank you.